Hi, this is Alec from EasierHabits.com, and this episode is a conversation between me and my wife in which I demonstrate some reflective listening techniques. And I am always surprised at how a little extra thought on how I communicate with other people creates much better conversations. And this was no exception. My wife mentioned afterwards, oh, I, I talk a lot more than usual in this one. And I'm realizing because I'm not bringing any of my own stories or judgments or comments into the situation, uh, I'm really focusing on her, reflecting what she said, asking some questions, very occasionally bringing observations about my interactions with her in without judgment. Um, she felt very free to express herself. It was a very positive conversation. Uh, we, you, you didn't get to see it after this, but after we stood up, there was just a lot of positive energy. And that is really what happens when you communicate well with your spouse. And so one of the things Meg and I offer is a communication workshop. It's two hours. We give you simple step-by-step -step ways to be a better communicator or a better listener. And we get a lot of positive feedback from young couples, from couples who have been married a long time, from couples on their second marriage. Um, wherever you are, a little more attention to how you communicate with your spouse can breed new insights, can breed a sense of understanding and support, and basically is the fuel that will help you overcome obstacles and deal with stress. So if you need to level up in your communication, if you're feeling a lot of stress or not feeling like the communication channels are, are distant, or you know if you have okay communication, but you want a little bit more to level up. We have people come in who have been to other communication workshops who uh, are really blown away about how a few simple practices still, after all these years, help them reinvigorate their conversations, help them understand each other better, and help them be more supportive spouses. So um, anyway, if you're interested in this, please check the link in the description about the communication workshops. You can sign up for a two-hour workshop. We understand that a lot of people are hurting for cash right now, and there are stressful times where a lot of couples need a little extra boost in their communication. So for a limited time, we're offering our workshops at $60. That means you can sign up for $60 and your spouse is free. It's two hours, and it is just a great way to get a little communication boost and strengthen your relationship in difficult times. So uh, with that, enjoy the video, and I look forward to working with you soon. So last week, Meg and I did a reflective listening exercise, which we taped. You can see the whole conversation link below in the description. But this week, I thought I would do sort of a commentary episode so you can kind of see what was going on in my head. I can show you the good, the bad, what I might change if I were to do it again, and hopefully get a little bit more out of this conversation. So I'll just fast forward through most of the conversation, pull out some highlights, and give my own reaction to them. And uh, we'll probably do a separate reaction video for Meg because her experience was much more holistic being the person talking. She can talk about what she thought going into the exercise, what she felt during and afterwards, uh, but it's less about particular moments since she's not trying to engage specific communication techniques. Like we're reading Cry the Beloved Country with one of my students and Lord of the Flies with another. And I think we just finished, uh, you know, a little while back, I finished a picture of Dorian Gray with another. So, like, there's there's a lot of different things I have to do for each and one of them. And you make sure you read all of those novels, I do, too, yeah. with them. So, yeah. you're not just walking them through that, you're rereading those. Yeah, or for my, you know, AP U.S. History, you know, student, like, I go through all the AP stuff for her. So, like, I'm, I'm really involved. So, even though I know how to ask questions and how to reflect... I noticed in the first four minutes of this video, I'm not heavily engaged. I'm just listening. I'm making eye contact. I'm nodding. But here is where I actually start using those communication techniques. I am reflecting what I'm hearing to her, but not just what I'm hearing. So Meg is going over the titles of books that she is covering with her clients. And there's a couple things I am understanding that in listing all of these things, she's talking about how much work she's doing. And I am highlighting that I understand how much work she's doing, not just by recognizing what she's saying, but also by recognizing the context. I know that Meg actually reads those books. So it's not just that she talks about those books with her clients and kind of reads cliff notes or tries to remember what she learned from high school. She actually rereads those books when she covers them with clients. And so that's why it's significant that she is going through a number of books with her clients. So um, that is a, a pretty good job of reflection, not just reflecting what I understand her saying, but the meaning of it, acknowledging her work and bringing in context and observations about her um, so that uh, she feels fully understood, right? I'm not just processing the words, but I am understanding her at a deeper level. And so that can be really involved, especially with like multiple applications. We've got deadlines. I have a client whose deadline is today. 
um, tonight, yeah, at midnight. So I have to make sure that all of her stuff is in line, that she's got everything filled out properly on her application before, um, you know, we click submit. So that means like you're literally going through all of the college requirements and like yeah. checking each box. And I even help them decide which program. So with yeah. this particular client, she's applying to grad school and she's like, well, I want to do finance. And I'm like, oh gosh. Okay, well, let's, you know, where do we start with that? So then I go through all of the, you know, different schools um, that have the best programs and the different types of programs. Does she want MBA? Does she want a master's? You know, uh, what, like, what are her goals in that? So I do coaching a lot, um, you know, with that. And So Meg does two things in reaction to my reflection of her college application work with her clients. One is she acknowledges it with body language she gives me a nod other places in the conversation she does that verbally with a yes that's right or yes that um, and the other thing that she does is she dives into deeper detail so whenever you engage with someone's detail that is an invitation for them to go more in depth in the topic and oftentimes this can be the difference between a boring surface level conversation and a deeper one is whether you as a listener engage with the detail either by reflecting it or by asking questions. Uh, of course, you still want to read the speaker a little bit, right? If they're talking about something that actually doesn't really interest them, trying to dive into the details will just annoy them. But if it's a topic they're passionate about and they're animated when they're talking, they're smiling, etc going into detail will give them a chance to talk about themselves or their interests or their passions, and that generally is a positive experience for people. And, you know, got certified and everything like that, but I just wasn't into the marketing stuff. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and then life happened. And then, like you mentioned, you do coaching, actually, regularly. And many yes. things you do, you just don't market yourself as a life coach. Exactly. Because the marketing part is hard. And it's hard for me to do. Well, it's hard and it's not exciting. Yeah. Sometimes I have a hard time doing things that are not fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or at least interesting or pose a challenge that I feel like. So you have like a long list of things you're willing to do. Like you're very active. You're doing a lot. You're working yeah. hard. But like it has to be in a certain vein. Yes. Like there's like, and, and I think that's true of a lot of people yeah. where, um, you know, you may feel lazy, but a lot of times that's just because you're not actively letting yourself uh, do the things that interest you, right? As soon as you let yourself explore something like, why don't I teach a class at the YMCA? You know, right. you pick that up and I see you very motivated and very, um, you know, very excited. Um, and I do notice actually going back to one comment you said earlier, um, you know, where you make a priority for me. I actually saw that last night. Uh, because you were working, 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 and you took some time out to just like hang, watch some anime with me, and then you went back to work. <laughs> and so, um, and you know, like I really appreciate that you took that time out, and I, I also observed that your bedtime was a little bit later than usual because of that. Uh, I did appreciate that. Nice to nice to be noticed. So there's a lot going on in this little clip, some good, some bad. The good is the affirmations that when Meg says something is hard for her, I say it's hard for me too, or hard for a lot of people. And a lot of people are their own worst critics. And what they do when they're critical of themselves, they feel less worthy, worthy than other people. And they uh, feel a little bit separated from other people if you let them know a lot of people are struggling with this or you're struggling with this. That builds a sense of connection and kind of breaks down that uh, self-critical isolation that people tend to mentally put themselves in. And so that's positive. The less positive is the fact that when she's searching for words, I jump in and reflect. Now, if you want to say something when someone's searching for words, that's an easy time to interrupt them. But if you are to leave silence, you can help them form their own thoughts. And if the purpose of this conversation is to help them express themselves and kind of figure things out as they're talking, then you want to give them silence to explore those things rather than interrupting. And on top of that, not only do I jump in and reflect there, I actually hijack the conversation a little bit, go back to an earlier point where she talked about making me a priority. I give an illustration of that and it is a sweet story in the sense of I'm letting her know I feel like she's making me a priority. And, you know, I feel like emotionally that did land. And you can see in her reaction um, that that was kind of unexpected, uh, but appreciated. And so it's not entirely bad, um, a bad thing to do. But in terms of the flow of conversation, I am 
not just listening, I'm kind of controlling and redirecting the conversation rather than simply following where Meg is going, which you know you might do in a more purely reflective listening practice. So the ideal time to have brought up that story about Meg taking time out for me would have been in the moment, right? When I see her go back to work after hanging out with me, um, that would have been the best time to leave positive feedback um, rather than kind of jumping into her conversation and injecting that in because that's something I feel I haven't said yet that I need to say. And, and there's church and there's like, I keep having all of these things pop into my mind and I usually try not to think about it. I just try to like go. <laughs> yeah. um, How does that work for you? Uh, the just not thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I, I can do it for a while, honestly. Like sometimes that is better than ruminating. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say that's always a bad thing, but then there are also times when I start getting into those behavioral patterns and I don't realize that I'm in a rut. Mm -hmm. Right. Or more likely than not, uh, certain self-care things, you know, mm -hmm. like stop happening. How does that work for you? How does that show up in your life? Or what does that look like for you? Are great open ended questions along with why questions that help people explore their experience more, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And you'll notice in her response, she not only lists the bad things about just getting hyper-focused on certain tasks, but she also uh, lists some of the benefits. And so that is a good example of how open-ended questions allow people to have complex thoughts on a topic rather than narrowly guiding them into an idea of like, oh, this thing is good, this thing is bad. Uh, it builds richer conversations. So like, it's working for me now. But if I don't at some point think about it, I will get to the point where something's not working for me anymore, but I won't realize it. And I'll just keep pushing through like it is. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so you um, kind of take a look once for like, you know, a period of time and kind of figure out like, what's the schedule for all of these things. Mm -hmm. And then you shut that part of your brain down so that you don't have to constantly be analyzing and you just run with it. Uh, for an extended period of time until like something more drastic catches your attention. That. So this is a good example of another reflection, but what I want to point out with this clip is not the reflection, which I've done several times in the video, but just the point where Meg's reaction is, yes, that, all right? That is an acknowledgement that this reflection is working and pretty much out of any reflection, what you want is to hear whether that reflection is accurate for the person or not. I think it just so happens in this conversation, we're pretty much on the same frequency. And so what you see is a lot of Meg saying, yes, that, and, and kind of acknowledging that. But it's perfectly fine for someone to say, well, actually, no, that's not really what I mean, either because uh, the listener hasn't understood it or because after saying something and hearing it reflected back, they realize they mean something different. And this is probably because these are things that Meg has thought a lot about before and told me about. So we've had some of these conversations. If these were topics that were newer to Meg, then she might have a lot more exploration and the reflections might have much more varied responses like, well, not quite. There's this one thing or no, that doesn't really fit at all. <laughs> and that's okay. Again, part of the purpose of the reflection is making sure that you're understood. And if you're not understanding the person that is speaking, it's okay for them to reframe. That's, that's one of the good outcomes, right? So don't feel like you have to get that response, although you want to get to that response. So if they correct you, then you just reflect again until they can say, yes, that's right, or exactly, or whatever. Things happen in life when you have kids, when you have COVID, when you have whatever, that force you to reevaluate. And so in kind of in those ways, I'm kind of grateful for those things. But um, but if you know there are no major upsets, then, yeah, I'm just going to keep going and not remember, oh, yeah, I need to, like, do that reevaluation and mm -hmm. make sure that everything is good. So, yeah, well, and we have in the past done kind of this is where we we see ourselves in a mm -hmm. year or a couple of years. Um, COVID actually influenced that we had like a three year plan mm -hmm. at but we hit COVID at the two year mark and we're just like, well, all right, it's up the <laughs> let's just go ahead with the plan. Cause we kind of had it in, um, you know, we had it in the chamber as like, yeah, I want to work for myself. We want a little bit more freedom. We want a house. 
which, you know, in COVID, when you're stuck at home a lot more, um, you know, that was huge for us, uh, lowering costs, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, a lot of came, uh, stuff came together. Um, you know, do you, so you expressed a few worries, like you worry about burnout, um, or worry about like dropping a particular plate, um, mm-hmm. or worry about, um, just going along a particular path and then figuring out, um, or not figuring out that things are changing and not adapting to that. Like, like which one of those are you most worried about? So it's kind of funny. You can see in my reflection where I realize I've gone from reflecting to kind of telling my own story. Meg is a little bit more in the role of a listener where she's nodding and saying, "Mm mm-hmm. And I just lose the thread of the conversation entirely. So I pause and ask an open-ended question, what worries you the most? And it's okay. Uh, When you're practicing reflective listening, there's going to be times where you just jump in with a thing you want to say and the story you want to tell and then realize like, wait, this isn't about me. And you can hand it back over to your partner with just an open-ended question. Let's see, something that you had mentioned actually before this, um, I, back before, again, and this was just like a month ago, um, you know, I was gonna be helping you with some of the marketing stuff, doing Pinterest and everything. I was really excited to do that. And then all of a sudden, all of this stuff came out of the woodwork and was like, hey, man, can you do this and this and this? And I'm like, ooh, there's money there. And oh, this is a really cool project. And so I started to say yes to everything, Yeah. right? And now I feel bad because I'm like, oh no, things changed. And now I'm, I don't have time for that. And you, again, being the incredibly like understanding person you are, are like, well, let's, let's revisit that. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, do, do you still have time? And I'm like, I don't know if I do. And I, I don't want to say that because I'm like, yeah. So, and this is something I've observed. Um, you do pick up things that you're interested. You do say yes to a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is kind of one default way you kind of find the things that actually work for you. Well, yeah. Is that you keep right? saying yes until the things that you actually weren't as excited about. And, you know, like you mentioned marketing, not that into No. <laughs> that they fall out. So I think there's like a certain amount where it's just like I observed like, well, first, actually, I felt a little bit like guilty. I haven't followed up with her on that. And then I realized like, oh, she's probably just not doing it. And I could probably just talk to her about that and let her... Let go because I'm focusing yeah. on marketing. I recognize like marketing is a lot of what I'm doing right now, and a lot of what I'm learning because it's hard for me to do. Yeah. Um, and so you know, I think, um, yeah, I, I don't. So so I observe that I, I don't necessarily view. Uh, I, I'd appreciate the help. So yeah. you know, if you if you do get back to where you were. That'd be great, but I forwarded that partially because you were at a place where you weren't doing a lot. It was one of your phases. I was like, so bored, and I was like, "What do I do?" Yep, yeah. And so I kind of recognized, like, "All right, well, if you have extra time, try this." And then I saw you filling up your schedule, and I do wonder, like, to a certain extent, is is the filling up your schedule a reaction to being asked to do something you don't want to do? You know, and sometimes I would think possibly, <laughs> except like this time, it was every it was people right. asking me. Right, okay, I wasn't yeah. seeking out any and of these It's true. The YMCA people talk to you. They asked you me that? the class thing um, the, that I'm doing was a request. Uh, the right. college stuff was a request. The Broadway, the Broadway stuff was a yeah, request. Like that's true. All of it, people are finding me. So this clip is the closest we come to conflict in our conversation. And I'd actually given Meg a heads up about this, and I wrote that in the vlog notes for the actual conversation episode itself. But uh, I don't like ambushing people with tricky situations, so I gave her a heads up. And I didn't bring this up because this conversation was for me to listen to her. It was just something I thought might come up in the flow of conversation, and she brought it up herself. Now, when we're addressing this, I think it's kind of important to clarify that you know there are critical needs and there are less critical needs. And so this is something I had asked Meg to do. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily a critical need. A lot of the things she does to help me, help me with videos or help me with the kids, uh, are a lot more critical to me. This was just an area where I thought, hey, I could use help marketing. She was free at the time. It was something we could explore. And I find that's really helpful to do when you're exploring a new relationship or a new way of working with someone in an existing relationship is start with some softball projects that aren't the end of the world if they don't do them or they're not done uh great um 
and w that gives people an opportunity to kind of gracefully back out of it and that's what you're seeing here if this were a more critical need i would need to have my own conversation in which i addressed those needs uh, but i certainly wouldn't want to hijack her conversation, the conversation in which I'm supposed to be listening to her and her needs with that. And so I kind of let this go with just a question, not a judgment, but asking if basically her way of filling up her schedule, which is what happened after I had asked her to do this task that's kind of difficult or ambiguous, not the kind of task she normally likes to do. I asked her if her filling up her schedule after that is a way of kind of getting around doing it. And so she just said, no, I don't think so, and, and kind of moved on. But there's no judgment attached to that. I didn't say, you know, are you trying to avoid me or are you trying to avoid this? I was just curious uh, because if I saw that behavior repeated in the future, like I ask her to do something and then suddenly her schedule gets really busy, um, I could start recognizing that as a behavior pattern, um, a, a her way of handling things. She might not even recognize it herself. Uh, but, you know, again, that was kind of a theory I just floated. She said no, and we can leave it at that. Um, it's, again, not making it personal, not making judgments, not saying you never help out or, you know, trying to make a big deal out of it, just, just letting it be. And if it's really something that's important to you, have your own conversation with your partner about that and give them a heads up. Hey, um, I am really frustrated or uh, I really need this thing, can we have a conversation about that, give them some time to get ready, and then have that conversation um, instead of just jumping into another conversation or having something else remind you of that thing in conversation and exploding on your partner. I get bored if I do one thing for too long. Yeah. Um, and so I like having the broad kind of, you know, expansive, I have so many different types of, you know, skills that I get to use, which is fun. Um, and so, yeah, does it work? Um, and I enjoy it. It's, I, I need that sense of urgency sometimes to actually get me to do stuff. Because if there's no sense of urgency, I'm like, oh, I can't do this. Because I love yeah. naps. <laughs> so now I take naps out of necessity, not out of necessity. <laughs> Nice. It's, it's a better way to take naps. I think so. Uh, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I guess, like, there's a part of me, I just have to, like, observe, like, it wants to problem solve, like, well, what else could I help you drop? <laughs> no, don't help me drop um, it. Well, or put down, do like, it. how, well, you know, how, so, so do you think you can continue at this pace indefinitely? Indefinitely, probably not, but for the time being, yeah. Sure. Like, I'm, I'm not worried about dropping any of the plates anytime soon. Again, because so many of them are new. Right. Um, the, the thing that is going to be difficult is if any one of them starts to take off so much that I do need to devote more specific time to that one because right. I love them all. And so at that point, it's not because of burnout. It's just because of the right. of on time. And I'm going to have to say no to something. Sad. So right here, I call out the fact that I am distracted by wanting to problem solve. And even though I call that out, you can see my next question is not one of my stronger questions. It's a yes, no question. Do you think you can keep up this pace indefinitely? It sounds judgmental or could be mistaken as judgmental. Uh, Meg is giving me the benefit of the doubt here. She's not nervous or um, she's not on edge about this because the rest of the conversation has been very open-ended positive and we have a lot of positive conversations, so that's not where we default to. But in a lot of other relationships, a question like that could sound negative. Uh, instead, Meg just very charitably pivots into a slightly different question, which is how does she feel about the way things are going? And her answer to that is she feels really good about it and she's not worried about dropping things right now. She just knows that's something in the future she'll have to think about. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to be. So I, I'm so grateful to be here right now in that any stressors that I do have are generally self-inflicted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, again, there's the insanity going on with the world um, and I, I can't even begin to yeah. address that. Um, yeah. But as far as my own personal life, the life of our family, mm -hmm. our immediate family, like really good. And I feel so blessed and, excited you know about what the future is going to bring as opposed to worried 
Yeah, I, and I know I inflict some of the stresses of the world on you by talking politics. Yes, you do. <laughs> and I love you. <laughs> so this is one of the areas of conflict that actually we've already worked through, which is the fact that I tend to obsess over trying to understand the world and why people do what they do and what leads to like conflict and misunderstanding. <clears throat> And was trying to optimize and troubleshoot things. And that includes, like, the political situation. And Meg just finds politics ex extremely stressful. I, I kind of find it stressful. It definitely has an impact on me. But I also have this obsession with, like, wanting to fix things or figure out how things could be better, even if I'm not someone who has control over the entire national politics or what have you. And so... Um, this is kind of what a conflict looks like after you've worked through it. I'm able to like just own that. She didn't, she didn't bring it up. She's not nagging me. I'm able to own that. Um, she acknowledges it. She doesn't do anything to soft pedal. She just, um, says that, um, you know, you do and I love you. And so, uh, you know, I think there's some work I can do there. Uh, just speaking of our relationship more broadly in general, uh, to be more thoughtful about how I have those conversations with her. But because we we do have conversations about that type of thing, it's not a big deal. And right, because we can talk over it, uh, talk about it, bring it up in conversations like this, it's not as explosive as it would be if, you know, Meg pretended everything was fine and never, you know, brought up how stressful it was, or I was defensive and, you know, didn't acknowledge the impact I have, even though I don't want to stress out my wife, that I do sometimes have that impact on her. And so that's a nice little segue there. Uh, in some senses, I'm sorry, I could provide more conflict for you and, and working through conflict, but that's kind of what happens when you work through conflict on a more regular basis, right? You you can bring up these things and acknowledge them and, and let them move on. Um, at some point where we have a lot more stressors in our life, we might be able to provide a conversation with more conflict. Um, whether or not we videotape that or not, I don't know. So one of my first reactions after this conversation was actually self-criticism. The immediate reaction actually was Meg saying that it was a really good conversation. She doesn't want all our conversations to be one-sided like this, but it's nice to have, and that she had more to talk about than she thought when she had a really good listener in the room. And sometimes I am not as good a listener is not what she said, but it's something I did kind of recognize that, that actually going through this exercise of intentionally being a better listener and editing any of as much of my own stories out as I could and focusing on her uh, really enabled her to explore her own ideas in more depth than uh, normally when I might be a more passive listener. But after she left, the first reaction that I had was that I probably didn't have enough eye contact. And that is a thing I do sometimes where I listen to people and I'm making connections with words and I'm figuring out uh, what... Uh, how to put those connections better and how to express them back to someone and I'm not attending to eye contact and body language enough. Well, you know, in this case, I didn't have any reason to believe that I didn't have eye contact ex except for that's something I think about myself. I'm, I've habituated myself to believe that. Uh, Meg hadn't said anything about eye contact. I didn't have any memories of like looking off to the side a lot or excessively. And when I watched this, I realized I had plenty of eye contact. And so um, that is another thing to think about with a lot of our communication and uh, the insecurities we feel around our communications, the judgments we feel. A lot of those are our own habituated judgments and not necessarily the observations or the feelings of other people around us. So uh, keep that in mind that um, when you have very stressful situations for you or situations in which you feel heavily judged, it, a lot of that feeling actually might be your own habituated self-judgment, not necessarily something that is in line with the facts of what happened or the opinions of other people about what happened. And until next week, make big changes one small habit at a time.